Okay, uh, so let's just remember the results of the discussion that we had last time. Remember that we had this uh, wave function at a certain instant in time, and we wrote it as e to the minus x over x0 squared uh, plus i k0 x. Okay, and we went through certain algebra. We said, okay, so please check your notes so that I don't write anything wrong. Uh, a, this a was something like uh, 2 over pi 1 fourth and I guess a 1 over root x0, right? Uh, so we chose that, okay, we uh, determined that constant a so that the wave function is normalized. And then we looked at certain quantities. We looked at average value of x, which was psi star psi x dx, okay, from minus infinity to infinity. And that gave us zero, basically, due to symmetry. And then we had uh, x squared, average of x squared was similarly minus infinity to infinity, psi star psi x squared dx. Remember this psi star psi acts like a probability okay, distribution so that whatever we want to average over, which is the function of x, we just multiply that by that function of x and integrate. And we got what x0 squared over 4. So if we look at the <coughs> deviation, okay, the fluctuation in x, uh, <coughs> which is going to be uh, the square root, okay, so this is something that we can also call as delta x, uh, which was the square root, so this is the root mean square, remember, <coughs> x minus average value of x, okay, squared like this, well, there's another average which I missed, okay, so average of x minus that squared, okay, so <coughs> how come Okay, so how do we determine this thing? So this is going to be the square root of, let me write this a little bigger, average value of square of this, which is going to be x squared minus 2x average value of x <coughs> plus average value of x squared, everything averaged over, right? But anything that's averaged over is really a constant and I don't have to average over again. So I'm going to get square root of, okay, average value of x squared minus two. Okay, I'll pull out the average value of x, but what remains is another average value of x plus average value of x squared. So these terms are both average value of x squared, so I end up with, okay, I'm sorry, I'm not closing brackets properly. So this is going to be square root of x squared average minus x average squared. And in our case, x average is zero, so it's just going to be the square root of this x squared average, which gives me x0 over 2. Okay, so that sort of makes sense. Remember that our Gaussian is something like this. As a function of x, I have something which goes like that. So here I have the maximum peak. Okay, I am just looking at the real part because you see this e to the i k 
zero x does not have any effect in any of this up to this time. We'll see why such a term, what that term is going to bring in a moment. But otherwise, this is just a Gaussian curve. And if that point is A, if you go down by, okay, e to the minus 1 times A, those are the points x0 and minus x0. So this x0 gives me the width of the Gaussian, okay? So this says that if I have a probability density function which is described by the magnitude squared of this Gaussian, well, the uncertainty in x, I know that the average value is going to be symmetric at this point, okay, x equals zero, but it turns out that the delta x, okay, is going to be <coughs> x zero over 2. Okay, so, well, not this big, but something like this. Okay, so that <coughs> gives us the fluctuation as, okay, defined as measured by this equation. Okay, so it just tells us how uh, wide this Gaussian is. Okay, is it all clear? Questions? Okay, so this is where we were last time. Okay, yes. So what is the okay, that's uh, if I, if I just forget about this piece here, when x is equal to x zero, okay, I have e to the minus one. Okay, so this is supposed to be. Let me write it a little better. So this level here is e to the minus one times a. So if the magnitude is a, this is e to the minus one times a. Okay. Other questions? All right, so now this is a wave function for which I determined this A. Remember how I determined it? I said, well, a <coughs> normalizable, okay, wave function. is one in which I take this psi star psi, integrate it minus infinity to plus infinity. So this is the probability of finding the particle somewhere between minus infinity and plus infinity. And I expect that to be equal to one. Okay, so if I get something finite out of this integral, just because I have, I can always multiply my wave function with a constant, I can adjust that constant so that I get a one, okay? So this process is called normalization. But not all wave functions are normalizable, okay? So for example, remember uh, the wave function that we started out with, the wave function for a free particle which <coughs> went like, okay, some constant, perhaps, e to the i kx minus omega t. Okay, so that's how we motivated the <coughs> Schrodinger equation and everything, that matter waves, okay, the electron, free electron, with a definite momentum, therefore definite energy, has a wave function which looks like this. Now, what happens when I look at the probability function corresponding to this? Well, I'm going to get an A and an A star, which is just going to be a constant. And what next? One. One, right? Because it's just a phase, independent of time, it's always one. So this is a constant, and if I try to integrate it from minus infinity to plus infinity, okay, it diverges, so there's no finite value of A that I can use so that I can uh, normalize this function. So this function is some extended wave function, not normalizable, okay? 
And therefore, we have to think a little differently about it. Okay, so we have to interpret this A somewhat uh, differently. We'll see how to normalize this functions in a somewhat different way as we go along. Uh, but at this stage, let's try to understand what's going on here. Now, in the general case, let me just start in fact a new page here. Okay, so let's <coughs> just consider the probability of finding a particle now in a finite part of space, okay, A x b, okay, probability that the particle is between A and B in general at time t is what? Okay, it's going to be integral from A to B of psi star, okay, of x and t, again I'll work in one dimension, psi x t dx. Okay, so it's going to be a function of time, right? And I want to uh, see now how this changes. Okay, so we interpreted the, this integral as the probability of finding the particle in a certain interval, but at least for the case when the particle is between minus infinity and plus infinity, we first of all hope that the normalization doesn't change, right? We set this a in our wave function to a certain value so that I get one at a certain time, but this wave function will develop in time and as it develops in time, I hope that the normalization is still there, okay? So the normalization doesn't change. Second, if I just look at a part of the probability, so here I am, I'm on the x-axis, this psi star psi is something like that, okay, psi star psi, and now I have put in two limits, a and b, so the integral here is exactly what I have written there. So how does the probability for finding the particle between A and B change as a function of time? Okay, so let's look at that. So I'm going to differentiate this. So dP dt is going to be the time derivative of that. So I have to differentiate this with respect to time, but there are two places where t appears, and those are functions of x and t, so I have to do partial differentiation. So I'm going to get a to b, okay, two terms, del psi star del t times psi plus <coughs> psi star del psi del t dx, okay? So that's how this is going to change. Now, how does psi change? Well, we have this nice Schrodinger equation which tells us that i h bar del psi del t is equal to what? Minus h bar squared over 2m Remember, this is the kinetic energy term. Hmm? Sorry, okay. I said Laplacian. Yes, well, not Laplacian. In one dimension, it's just the derivative with respect to the x coordinate. Okay. Psi. And then I have the potential energy term, which is V psi. Okay, so that's our Schrodinger equation. Now, I need del psi del t, so just to make my life easier, okay with my finger here, I'm going to erase this one over i h bar and put it on the right hand side, i h bar. Okay, so that's what del psi del t is. Now, what about the 
change in the complex conjugate, well, I just evaluate the complex conjugate of this equation. So del psi star del t, okay, I have to be careful, there's an i here. So it's 1 over minus i h bar. Okay, then minus h bar squared over 2m del squared del x squared, these are all real stuff. Then I have psi star plus v is real, okay, it's the potential, and I get a psi star there, okay? Now we'll put all of that stuff in here. Okay, so it's going to be integral a to b. All right, so let me pull out some constants. Okay, so I can cancel a set of h bars here, and I can cancel the minus signs in this equation. Oh, no, I can't, sorry, because there's a v here, right? So, uh, in fact, the same thing is, okay, maybe I'm doing this a little bit too early, so let me not cancel anything, sorry about that. Okay, so let me just write this as the first term, which is going to be psi times del psi star del t, okay? So what is that? Let's just put that down carefully now. Okay, now I can cancel my h bars and the minus signs. Okay, so it's going to be plus, please check my algebra, I'll make many mistakes, h bar over 2im, right? 2im. Uh, del squared, del x squared of psi star plus, well, actually minus, minus 1 over i h bar uh, v psi star. Okay, so that's that first term. So let me make this a nice big bracket. Okay, so plus psi star times, now I have this term. So now I have a minus h bar over 2im and plus i, let's see, plus 1 over i h bar v psi. I missed the derivative here. Del squared x squared psi plus, right, v psi. Okay, all of this thing integrated. Okay, I just put in the Schrodinger equation wherever I see the time derivative. Okay, that's all I'm doing. All right, now you see there's a term here which says psi, psi star v divided by minus one over i h bar, but here I have the same thing with the plus sign. Okay, so this term here cancels that term there, okay? So they are both psi star psi times v over h bar, and one of them comes with a minus one over i, the other one comes in with a plus one over i, okay? So those terms cancel. So I have now a psi times second derivative of psi star over here. Here I have the same thing with the opposite sign, but psi star second derivative of psi this time. Okay, so the term, the two terms are going very nice and symmetrically. Okay, so let's just continue the algebra. D P D T is equal to. All right, now what I'm going to do is actually just integration by parts, which means that I'm going to take one of these derivatives to the 
left hand side. But the way I like to do it is so that everything is more transparent. Yes. Why did we came uh, order of operations? Which? First time, for the first time. This one? Yes. OK, so this is just a derivative okay, of psi star with respect to t times psi. So it really doesn't matter. This is also equal to psi times del psi star del t. OK, so these are two okay, complex functions. Doesn't matter which way I write them. OK, so this time derivative differentiates only Okay, this psi or that psi. Okay, so it's not something that operates everything to the right. Okay, other questions? Yes. I couldn't understand this whole expression. Where does the second derivative come from? Okay, they, it, it comes from the Schrodinger equation. Okay, so wherever I see a del psi del t, I put that into this equation. OK, and for this psi star, del psi star del t, I put that in that equation. OK, so it becomes psi times whatever I have here. OK, and over here I have psi star times whatever I have there. OK, yes. Sorry, I missed you. But why did we have to evaluate dp over dt? Why? just because we are curious, OK? okay? We, are, we want to know how this is changing, OK? All right. <clears throat> so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to say that, OK, I have these second derivatives here, and they operate only on one of the psi's. But I'm going to write this down, OK? So it's now going to be a really long integral. OK, I am going to write this down, so big bracket again. OK, God knows when I'm going to close it. And then I'm going to write this term as if it is d dt, OK, in fact, partial derivatives again, del, del t of, I'm sorry, x, where did t come from? Okay, so del, del x of all of this stuff. Now you see I can factor out some of this. In fact, let me just factor out an h bar over 2i m so that I don't have to write it twice. Okay, except that I have a plus sign here and a minus sign there, so I have to be careful. Okay, derivative of psi times del del x psi star, OK, minus the second term, psi star del del x psi, OK? Now, can I do that? Careful. I have these two second derivatives. Yes, um, we, um, we can apply um, product rule, and um, there are two um, del pi over del psi times the del over del x del pi, um, okay. and they cancel. OK, so I have made something illegal, really, because this object also differentiates the first psi here, which I don't have that there. And it also differentiates that, right? Yes. Yes, they cancel. Very good. So you can see it in one look, OK? For people in, at my age, we have to do them explicitly, OK? So I, I want to correct my mistake. So I'm going to subtract out my mistake. What is my mistake? Well, it is going to be del psi del x OK, del psi star del x minus del psi star del x del psi del x. OK, so 
Now I have corrected my differentiation mistake, but then I noticed that these things cancel anyway, so I really didn't have to do that, okay? All right, so finally I can close my bracket and that's my integral. Okay, so what do I end up with? I end up with some function which I am differentiating with respect to x and then integrating it with respect to x. Okay, so what does that mean? I get my function back, right? If I differentiate something and then integrate it, except that I have to be careful with the limits. So this is going to be equal to h bar over 2 i m, and I am going to get this term here, which is going to be psi. Okay, so let me write for some reason. Please let me put a minus here and write the second term first. Psi star del psi del x psi minus psi del del x psi star. Okay, but I have to now evaluate these things at A and B. Okay. Now I have some function here minus its complex conjugate. So what does that give me for a complex quantity? If I careful. Imaginary parts times two. Imaginary part times two. Okay, so this is really if I take <coughs> the uh, complex conjugate of something, I am going to get twice the imaginary part of <coughs> psi del del x psi star. Do I have an i with it? What's the notation? Some a mathematician in class tell me. If I have z equals i a plus i b, how do I write this? This is real part of z plus i times a imaginary type times b. Okay, so this I am z, not b. Hmm? Z. Okay, thank you. Okay, so if I do that, then I get, of course, an i here. Okay, so i times the imaginary part of that. So that i is going to cancel that i. So the imaginary part of a complex number is actually real. Okay, interesting terminology, but that's what it is. Okay. And also the twos cancel. I now get this quantity. Okay, so let me give that thing a name. Let me call h bar over m times the imaginary part of psi. Uh, let me see. I put the star in the wrong place, right? Imaginary part of this first term because the second one is the complex conjugate of the other one. Okay, so imaginary part of psi star del del x psi. Let me call this function. You see this is a function of x. Where? Oh yes, but I'm just looking at this part now, okay? So I'll put the minus sign in. Okay, so that quantity here, I am going to call j of x, okay? Some function of x. So what do I get here? I get minus 
j at b minus j at a. Or j at a minus j at b. Okay, so this tells me that the probability of finding the particle between A and B is changing due to something happening at A, one limit, and the same thing happening at B, except that at A, the same thing helps to increase the probability, okay, if J is positive. If this J is positive at B, it tends to decrease the probability, okay? So I interpret this as some probability current. So there is this J A, J at A, which is pushing probability into this region as a function of time, and J B taking probability out of that region. Okay, so this quantity, J of X, is called the probability current. So the probability of finding the particle between two points changes as a function of time. Okay, that's reasonable. If the particle is moving, at some time it may be here, and at other time the probability may end up over there. So the probability here is going to decrease, probability there is going to increase, okay? So I have to <coughs> obtain, okay, some okay, some uh, indication of that through this algebra. Okay, so is this clear how this is working out? Yes. For the derivative, uh, in terms of x, we, we said that the pi's are uh, normalized. Okay, this, these psi's are not normalized yet. Okay, so we don't know anything about it yet. This is very general. Okay. So, okay, so at this point, it's general. In fact, we are going through this so that we can look at these non-normalizable uh, functions as well. So this is for any psi, normalizable or unnormalizable. Suppose it's normalizable, okay, then ask your question. So, uh, assume that the size at the minus and uh, plus and minus infinities uh, both tends to go to zero, can we assume that also its derivative tends to go to zero? Well, yes, usually, uh, unless you have a very weird function, if the function goes to zero, its derivatives also go to zero at infinity, okay, at infinity. Otherwise, how can you have a constant infinity if you have a uh, slope? Is, is, is some of them uh, assume that the derivative just goes to zero? They yes, to zero. they will, they will uh, go to zero, okay, for any sensible physical function, okay? So, in fact, we can also discuss that case. What happens if this is a normalizable function and I take A to be minus infinity and B to be plus infinity? What does this tell us then? Okay, this J in that case goes to zero, right? If A is corresponds to minus infinity and B co corresponds to plus infinity, for a normalizable function, these psi's are zero. So I am going to end up with zero current. So what does that mean? Okay, so suppose I am interested now in the case when I just go through the same algebra except that A is now going to minus infinity and B is going to plus infinity and at those points J at A is going to be zero, J at B is going to be zero. So the probability will be conserved. Okay, so in that case, 
if it's a normalizable function, the total probability will be conserved. So that means normalization will not change. That's very nice because if we are losing normalization, then of course it's not a uh, good interpretation as a probability function. Okay? Good. Other questions? Um, about the better function goes to zero if you the the function derivative goes to zero if it goes to zero to infinity. I found a counterexample. e to the minus t times sine of e to the two t. Um, it goes to zero as t goes to infinity because sine is bounded. But when we take its derivative, then um, by using chain rule, um, at certain points it um, just blows up its derivative. Well, uh, okay. Again, it has to be a really weird function yeah. to. Uh, uh, to have a finite derivative uh, when the uh, function itself is going to zero at infinity. Okay, those things uh, you will have difficulty associating with an actual real particle. Okay, so let's return back to our original problem of what this means for, okay, I want to just keep this exponential because we are going to need it again. So let me <coughs> discuss that over here. Okay, now we are back to our original, okay, psi, where we said, okay, what happens if my psi corresponds to the wave associated with a free particle, okay, x minus omega t. So we saw that this is not normalizable, but at least let's look at what the probability flow associated with it is. So this is some function. If I just plot it as a function of x, so this is psi star psi, as a function of x, it will just be a constant extending from minus infinity to plus infinity, and it has a constant magnitude, a times a star. Okay, but if I look at what j at any point x is, that's going to be, let me put a box around this so that I can find it more easily, h bar over m, okay, times psi star, okay, so maybe I'll write the equation once here. Okay, so h bar over m psi star, imaginary part of psi star del psi del x. And I'm going to get h bar over m, imaginary part of complex conjugates of psi which will be a star e to the minus i k x minus omega t, right, complex conjugate. Then the, the x derivative of this object. x derivative of the object is going to bring down an i k, so it's going to be a times i k times the function itself, e to the i kx minus omega t. Okay, the exponentials will cancel. And I have a times a star, which is real. And then I have i times k, which is purely imaginary. So I just pick out the imaginary part, which is going to be a times a star. Okay, so it's going to be a times a star h bar, and I'll get a k, 
h bar k over m. So this says there is a constant probability current flowing from minus infinity to plus infinity. How much the current is depends on this a times a star. Okay, so this is, remember, like the probability density, it's a density. What does h bar k over m resemble classically? What was h bar times k? Momentum. Divided by mass. Okay, so it's the, classically I would associate that, let me put in quotation marks, the velocity of the object. So you have density times velocity. Okay, so that's how much probability flow you have in the x section. Thank you. All right. So just think of this as, as if this is a gas, for example. If you had some gas atoms, etc., and they are moving with some velocity v towards the right, how much material is being transported, okay, as a function of time? Well, you would say the density of the material here times the velocity is the uh, amount of material per surface area that's moving towards the right, right? So we have a similar structure here. We have a probability density multiplied by the something like a velocity, momentum divided by mass, which corresponds to, okay, probability flowing in the plus x direction, okay? So that's now the interpretation that we are going to assign to this constant A. It will tell us how much, okay, probability per unit time is moving toward the right. Now, why is this going to be useful? Well, we are going to solve a set of problems uh, which we'll call scattering problems. Okay, scattering is an important part of physics. In fact, most of the information that we obtain about materials at microscopic scale, not only materials, but even particles themselves, we build all these big uh, accelerators, particle accelerators, etc., just to scatter one thing out of another. Okay, so if you want to know what's inside a proton, we hit one proton with another proton and see what's coming out and try to make sense of it. Okay, so <clears throat> similarly, in quantum mechanics, we are going to be interested in sending a particle. Okay, so I shoot my electron towards the right with some energy, which will correspond to a wave like this. So it will move, okay, in space. And over here will be something else, okay, some potential V of X, which is going to be finite in a small part of space. That's where this other thing that I am hitting is. And then the electron will scatter, okay, it will either bounce back or we'll move through it. And by looking at how much of it has been reflected and how much of it has passed through, I can guess what this V of X is, okay? So we'll be drawing all these potentials all around, but no one actually can go in and measure the potential in a microscopic structure. What we do is we scatter off these objects and then see what type of potential is consistent with that type of scattering. So for <clears throat> problems like this, we'll be sending in a psi, which is, which we'll call incident on the particle, and some of that psi will be reflected, and some of it will be passing through, okay? So that's where this is going to be extremely useful. Let's see, okay, we have a few more minutes. Let me, <coughs> Just extend this one more step. What happens 
if I have a psi okay I said for psi equal to that and I obtain this okay if I have psi equal to a e to the i kx minus omega t okay so this is going to be a wave again moving towards the right but suppose it is in superposition with so suppose I have a second wave which is now moving in the other direction e to the i minus kx minus omega t okay so this is a wave with momentum k moving towards the right this has the same momentum moving towards the left what type of current does that correspond to okay so let's just look at it so j at x let me just rewrite the equation again h bar over m imaginary part of psi star del psi del x okay and I have h bar over m imaginary part of psi star so the complex conjugate of everything there a star e to the minus i kx minus omega t plus b star e to the okay minus i minus kx minus omega t all of that multiplied by the time I'm sorry the x derivative of that so let's look at what that is that's going to be a derivative with respect to x will bring down an ik e to the i kx minus omega t okay plus b e to the okay derivative with respect to x will bring down a minus ik e to the minus i okay well okay minus e to the i minus kx minus omega t okay so now there are lots of terms we have to look at them one by one because there will be cross terms imaginary part of okay there's an a a star term so it's going to be a star a i k and the exponentials cancel similarly there is a b b star term okay b star b there's a minus ik and the exponentials cancel okay now we have to look at the cross terms there's a plus a star a term okay I'm sorry a star b term a star b term so that comes into the minus ik right and the exponentials what happens to the exponentials I have plus i omega okay so e to the <coughs> minus 2i k x right yeah. and then I have plus b star a which is going to have an exponential e to the okay b star a so it's going to be 2i k x yes and there is also an ik which is important okay but now if you look at these 
terms, one is the complex conjugate of the other, right? So if I add them together, I get something real. Okay, the imaginary parts cancel. So that when I take the imaginary parts, that makes no contribution. So at the end, what I get is since everything is real except this ik part, I get h bar k over m, okay, a star a minus b star b. So how do I interpret this? Okay, so these things correspond to two waves which are moving in opposite directions. The A star A contributes to positive current in the plus X direction, minus B star B corresponds to negative current. Okay, so it corresponds to a current probability current towards the right corresponding to this term, okay, with positive momentum, and it corresponds to current in the opposite direction here. Yes? Okay, it's just a complex number. So you see I have A star B here, and here I have its complex conjugate, A B star, minus IK plus IK, e to the minus i, whatever, e to the plus i, whatever. Okay, so whatever complex number this is, this is its complex conjugate. So if I add a complex number with complex conjugate, the imaginary parts cancel. Okay, so it's purely real, yes. Okay, so if you, the question is how do I know the directions of these things? The easiest way is if you look at a wave which has the form e to the i kx minus omega t, I can write this as e to the i, okay, let me factor out a k, x minus omega over k t. Okay, so this is a wave in which the velocity is, this is the velocity term, the velocity is toward the right, so the wave phase velocity is in the plus x direction. If I look at the other one, e to the minus, well, e to the, okay, let me factor out the minus, i k x plus omega t, okay, which is what this is. This is going to be, just do the same thing, e to the minus i k, but this time I have x plus omega over kt, which corresponds to a velocity in the opposite direction, so it's moving towards the left, okay? Other questions? Okay, let's have our 10-minute break, and we'll continue.